Speakers are supposed to introduce themselves? Definitely. Ah, okay. Sorry, that part I uh, sort of forgot about. Uh, but I can be pretty brief. So, um, uh, my name is Fred McIntosh. Uh, I'm in uh, Amsterdam at the, uh, at the, well, Free University, it used to be called. What's your Free name? Universiteit McIntosh. Sorry. That, that's my story. Uh, nothing particularly uh, uh, obscene. Um, and uh, although, it, as you can tell, as you can probably tell from my uh, Dutch accent and my last name, I'm not originally from the Netherlands. Um, I'm from the States, uh, and my background is in uh, theoretical condensed matter physics, uh, which is probably not unfamiliar to many of you. I, I suspect there's a number of people from the condensed matter background. Uh, it indeed is pretty good training uh, for thinking about uh, obviously collective states of matter, that's what tends to interest us, systems with many degrees of freedom. Uh, biology is a system with many degrees of freedom, way too many degrees of freedom for, for, for most of us, and, and I consider myself in that category. So we tend to take a sort of reductionist approach. I'm going to go to an extreme reductionist approach, as I'll indicate a little bit later uh, today. But um, from that condensed matter background, I got increasingly interested in soft matter systems. And did a uh, postdoc at Exxon, where I actually overlapped with Phil and a couple of other people who you will um, see in the giving lectures here. Exxon was a great place back in those days to do uh, soft matter. Obviously, Kodak had some good uh, soft matter, particularly polymer uh, uh, people as well. But Exxon was Exxon and a couple of other industrial labs represented an interesting period of, I would say, scientific history in the US, which is sadly gone, um, which uh, was when uh, some of these uh, you know, major corporations would actually invest in basic science. And Exxon was a place where people could do very basic work. As a postdoc, I was told not to work on anything proprietary, do publishable stuff. Uh, and that was just great. Um, nice big travel budget didn't, didn't hurt either. Um, anyway, uh, and over the years, obviously from soft matter, I've gotten increasingly interested in a favorite soft matter system, which is uh, the cell. And so I've sketched here actually a um, my very crude uh, approximation of the typical animal cell. Plant cells, many of you will know, um, have a much more specific, uh, you could say almost more macroscopic mechanical construction involving cell walls and things like that. Animal cells tend to be softer, <coughs> and we're going to look at some of their components. Um, but, uh, well, obviously, you know, many of us come at this thinking of the soft matter aspects of the systems. Uh, and so indeed they are uh, pretty soft. We're going to start looking at some numbers as we go along. But uh, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about um, what, uh, what I want to do. Um, so today, as I said, I'm going to take a pretty uh, reductionist approach. We're basically going to be talking about almost the whole time about single polymers. Now, when these polymers get kind of stiff, which is the ones that I'm going to, oh, which is characteristic of the ones I'm going to focus on, um, they're quite rich, and so you can spend a surprising amount of time looking at the single polymer properties. I will, at the end, connect those single polymer properties to more macroscopic properties, such as things like shear moduli, how stiff are these systems, um, and show you real data. So at the very end, I'll put up some you know, real data, real science, you could say. Um, and in the meantime, I'll be doing theory. Um, but So this is, this, this is the system that motivates a lot of this work. Um, you, it's probably late to say this in this school, but I imagine uh, many of you didn't realize uh, at the beginning of uh, this school that in fact polymers play an interesting role in biology, and it turns out that uh, polymers constitute a major structural, um, say design aspect, although that's a loaded term, 
um, of a uh, typical cell. They're clearly present uh, everywhere. And there's a number of key players that I want to focus on. Um, and uh, the one that probably the first comes to mind is DNA. That's what I've sketched in blue here as a sort of, um, well, very cloudy, sort of murky, unclear, interesting, subtle, very hard to understand, compact structure in the, in the nucleus. Um, that's not going to be so interesting for most of what I want to talk about today, uh, but I will say some things about DNA because it, there's been some very nice work on that over the years. Um, the, in, a, in a sort of condensed matter or structural sense, in terms of the mechanical properties of these systems, polymers that play a much more important role are filamentous proteins. So these are long uh, filaments typically arranged with multiple globular proteins that bind together to form long filaments. And one of the first that strikes you when you look in a microscope um, at a cell are the so-called microtubules. And as the name implies, there's a sort of tubular structure to these. It's a fascinating system in its own right. Um, imagine uh, a assembled tube which is of very small scale, 20 nanometers in diameter, to the level of precision I'm going to be working. A little bit more than 20, but about that. Uh, in cross-section, it's a collection of uh, globular proteins, as I said, which actually arrange to form a long uh, tubular structure. All these things are chiral, by the way. Any protein, anything in biology is essentially chiral, so they typically have a little twist in them. Um, sort of like DNA. Um, but uh, as a structure, it's quite fascinating. There's been a lot of work trying to understand the uh, basic mechanics, even down at the single polymer level. They're rich. You can push on them on the side and look at how they deform, and you can, to some extent, treat the system as an elastic tube. Now, interestingly, it's 20 nanometers in diameter, but Unlike the polymers we've been thinking about for the most part uh, so far, um, it's very far from a random coil configuration, even in the presence of thermal fluctuations. And this brings up the notion of what's called a persistence length. Very crudely speaking, I'll be more precise in a moment, it's basically the length scale over which this polymer would appear straight, even in the presence of thermal fluctuations. We're, we're living in a Brownian world. There's a lot of fluctuations down here at the micron scale. Nevertheless, these microtubules, in spite of their teeny dimensions, transverse, they have monstrously large uh, persistence lengths of order a millimeter. That means if you looked at them in a microscope, it would be this long filament which would barely move at all in the, in the microscope. Now, a little bit softer, you have um, what's called F-actin. It's one of the most prevalent proteins um, in um, a typical animal cell. Um, you might have run across it in a biology class in terms of muscle. So it turns out our muscles are composed of actin is half of what make up our muscles, we say. Um, these also form filamentous uh, proteins. I won't try to draw them. I'll show a picture later. Uh, but they're a little bit more like a DNA kind of structure. It's sort of uh, globular proteins next to each other in some helical arrangement. Um, but larger scale. So um, up at the 7 nanometer diameter level, roughly. Um, they're more flexible. They have a um, persistence length which is more comparable to cellular dimensions. They typically form a naively rubbery-like polymer meshwork near the periphery of a cell, but not only. Turns out actin also forms what are called stress fibers. And so you'll also find bundles of actin coming together to form stress fibers. And these do bear a lot of uh, force uh, within uh, some cells and are responsible for like pulling on the external environment. Um, and then there's a, there's a much larger class, in a certain sense, of much more mysterious filamentous proteins called intermediate filaments. They're mysterious for a couple of reasons. They're harder, they've been harder to work with. They're a little bit harder to purify and, and uh, so on. They're also much less general. 
um, in the sense that microtubules and actin, those first two I mentioned, they're basically in, the same in us as they are in yeast, to a, to a good approximation. There's even analogs of these proteins in bacteria. So apparently, nature came up with these uh, structures pretty early on. Intermediate filaments wind up being a much broader class of much more specialized filaments, but all with a very similar uh, construction principle. I'm not going to go into that, but it's an area where there's a lot of work going on right now trying to understand them. They occur in a number of different contexts. As I said, they're more um, uh, specific. Actually, names might, uh, you might have run across. Uh, keratins, they're intermediate filaments. Um, uh, you typically get a structure of element, uh, uh, intermediate filaments around the nucleus, um, a sort of matrix that forms around the nucleus. Um, they are sometimes involved in connections between cells, which I tried to sketch here. Desmonds, I believe, is, is a class of those. Um, anyway, uh, they're, from a physicist's point of view, they're yet less universal. From a biologist's point of view, they're much richer and more varied. So, it sort of depends on your point of view. Um, now, interestingly, so let me continue this list down here. I mentioned these intermediate filaments. They're a bit of an outlier for reasons which I'll indicate in a moment. They're kind of big. They're somewhere in size dependent with, uh, uh, between actin and microtubules. Let's say of order 10 nanometers in diameter. But they have a very low persistence length compared with these, um, less than about 1 micron. Now that raises an interesting puzzle, which I'm going to get into. And that relates to this persistence length. So, what determines the, how, how rigid these polymers are? Well, obviously, if I, I mean, you know, why is it that tubes are used a lot in construction? You get a lot of the mass away from the center out to a large radius, so that when you curve it, you get large deflections, and therefore the stiffness of the medium, if you like, reduces the bending of the rod as a whole. Okay? So no wonder these things are quite rigid. Um, I want to try and characterize that, that rigidity a little bit more in detail and go back to this list of numbers. Um, but before doing so, let me remind you of something which has been mentioned, I believe, uh, the persistence length. Um, in fact, there's a key equation that was written down in one of the earlier lecture notes. I forget which of yours, uh, but it was written down. Sorry, question. There's no such thing as a silly question. Why do they... Mine doesn't need a why do they oh, do they yeah. Do they so actually, the construction of these microtubules is, it, I, I already indicated, it's pretty fascinating in its own right. Let me give you some of the, the puzzles here. So a typical microtubule um, in uh, a healthy cell uh, will have um, a nice um, lucky number 13 protofilaments around its circumference, about 13, seriously. So the number of these things, about 13, they form what are called protofilaments that go down the axis. Um, people have tried to look a lot at, at the construction of these systems and why you get tubes and so on. It turns out they're also, uh, in some cases, pre-stressed tubes in that if you start breaking these, the bonds between these protofilaments, they'll sort of splay out. Now, you could, argue, you could, uh, you could imagine that maybe a pre-stressed structure is stronger than the pre-stressed concrete. Um, Anyway, um, why it's tubular? Well, um, actually what, what microtubules will typically do is form sheets. In fact, if you do it near, a, near an interface, they'll frequently form a, a big sheet of connected um, uh, protofilaments. And it's not uh, surprising that that might want to close up and get additional binding energy uh, of the tube. Uh, it turns out that the, the there's a lot of variation in the number of the number of protofilaments in microtubules can vary from probably down to 10 would be on the low side up to 17 or 18, uh, I think I've heard of. Um, so it's not a terribly precise tubular structure. Don't think of DNA, which has a super precise and well-defined structure. These are a little bit well less well-defined. There's also defects in them, and studying the defects is kind of interesting. But it seems tubular construction is pretty common. Yeah? 
do each of these tend to exist in compression or tension or ah yeah. oh yeah that's that's a that's a loaded subject it turns out um, in in biology uh, there's this uh, model which has been introduced called tensegrity uh, you might know about engineering tensegrity structures which are combinations of compressive and tensile uh, elements. There's a lot of reason to believe that some aspects of that model are realistic, but that model itself turns out to be super controversial, it's fair to say. Um, so don't think of a tensegrity structure with nice reg regular arrangements of these things. But uh, if you're interested, I could pull up some images that show microtubules under compression. They do appear in many cases to be compressively loaded. And the whole subject of pre-stress in these networks uh, is interesting when we get to active systems. So we're going to look at how stresses develop inside the cell, and, the, and generically these systems are actually stressed. Um, actually, that, that uh, uh, reminds me to go back and say another thing by way of introduction. Um, the plan, as I said, is I'm going to focus on single polymer properties today. Ending, hopefully, if there's time, with dynamics to show you a little bit about how these systems uh, fluctuate and, and move around. Um, and then uh, I want to turn to, um, indeed, active systems, which, which you'll notice is the title of the last two lectures. But in between, I actually want to spend most of the time in the next lecture looking at the Brownian world a little bit more generally and starting with equilibrium. So I'm going to... It, you'll notice in the back of the notes, there's an appendix on uh, so-called linear response theory and uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. I imagine many, many of you have heard that vaguely, but uh, I'm not going to take the time to prove it, but I'm definitely going to spend some time going through it. Um, anyway, so if you'd like, it's almost more three different topics, but you'll see they're all related. Okay, so... Back to the rigidity of these systems and how to characterize it. Usually, this persistence length is used interchangeably with mechanical rigidity. And the basic reason is as follows. So um, if you uh, characterize the shape of this polymer by an angle as a function of its arc length along its backbone, that arc length I'll call S. I'm not explicitly referring to it here. But I just want to look at the correlation between this angle and that angle at some other point. And so what I'd like to do is take a thermal average of this um, <coughs> cosine telling me how similar those two uh, uh, orientations are. And of course, starting with just the ordinary um, uh, rule of uh, trigonometry that I hope we all at least vaguely remember, I can always represent a um, cosine of a... Um, sum of two angles as a product of the cosines of the two angles minus corresponding expression for the sines. And as soon as I take thermal averages here, um, I notice a couple things. These two things become independent. So in other words, the way in which these angles are correlated is independent to these. So the assumption is that whatever the fluctuations do, they give rise to independent bends at each point. And then, when you take these averages of the signs, they go away. So that's why I don't need them. Yes? That's only for when the elements are in the problem, right? Uh, yeah, so I'm assuming I have a nice elastic rod. Oh, yeah, you're raising a tough question. How much should I treat this as an, as an isotropic elastic medium? It's... Uh, it, you'd be surprised how well that works, but it does, buy, it does de uh, deviate from that in detail in some interesting ways. But I'm going to start with that. Um, and as an illustration of that, I want to mention a problem here in connection with these numbers. So anyway, um, I'm not going to belabor this point, but just noticing the simple tri trigonometric property, you notice that I have to have some sort of product rule satisfied to, uh, between the way angles at distant points are related to each other in terms of the correlations in between. And if you think about it, that basically means that this thing here, um, this quantity here, <coughs> has to be equal to e to the minus s3 minus s1 
the distance between these two points along the arc length, um, has to decay exponentially, and then there's just a rate of decay. And that rate of de decay is what's called the persistence length. Um, now, there's a, there's a more complete derivation of this step by step in the notes. I'll let you look at that. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about this is, um, well, the important thing to note about this, more important than going through the calculation, is some words of caution, I would say. So, um, in the literature, you'll find persistence length used interchangeably with rigidity of the system. And the basic reason for this is, when I write down the bending energy, for a filament like this. I could do it in terms of um, curvature, which um, is a curvature at any particular point S along the backbone. And that curvature would, for instance, in this problem, just be the rate of change of the angle. I'm doing this in two dimensions, so everything's lying in the plane so far. The bending energy, if I have a system which has no particular preference for bending one way or the other, <coughs> should be quadratic in that curvature. And presumably, I just integrate that along the backbone of the polymer. And then what I have is just a, a, a um, phenomenological parameter that tells me how rigid the system is. And I'll put in a factor of kappa, the bending stiffness, divided by 2. <coughs> Because this looks like a harmonic energy, basically. Now, if you think about the dimensions here, curvature has units of inverse length. It's an inverse radius of curvature. I square it and multiply by a length. I get an overall factor, which is units of inverse length. This is supposed to be an energy. So apparently, kappa has to have units of energy times length. Now if I go back to this persistence length here, presumably that persistence length depends on how rigid the polymer is. So obviously, um, I might expect that persistence length to be proportional um, to the uh, bending rigidity, more rigid, uh, longer persistence length. The longer range, I get angular correlations here. But it also decreases with temperature, because thermal fluctuations excite uh, the bending modes. Now, this is almost true. Um, it, it, it's actually just a dimensional argument at the moment. Um, I say it's almost true, because in two dimensions, the persistence length <laughs> is twice that. And in three dimensions, I don't have a factor of two. <coughs> so this is the more familiar expression you'll see. Anyone care to uh, say why there's a factor of two difference? Yeah? Three dimensions is a two dimensional angle. Yeah. So everything here is done in the plane. That means I'm screwing up by leaving out all the fluctuations in the other direction. If I'm if I'm looking at something which is nearly straight, then the two transverse directions for fluctuations are independent of each other. They add independently in quadrature, if you like. And so I get fluctuations which add, um, and therefore I get twice the rate of decay of the angular correlations, a shorter persistence length. So this is actually relevant to some experiments. People have looked at persistent, at trying to measure persistence lengths of filaments confined in a plane. And so you could be off by a factor of two if you do that. Um, OK, one more thing um, before looking so, at some so numbers. Fred, even, yes. even at, at, at that issue, uh, suppose you do a, a confocal experiment and you're looking at a, at a at a confocal slice, so you're looking at a plane but in the bulk, and you look and you look at the, you measure the two or not? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, I, there's a lot of practical issues in using confocal that way because I'm going to lose fluctuations out of the plane. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you might say, oh well, just look at the polymers that happen to lie in the plane. I'm making a selection of my sample then. Yeah. So then I'm probably not getting a good ensemble average. So then you get the then you then you get the two. 
Well, I still have the third dimension fluctuations in between two points. So I would say uh, you really will be able to get a, get a um, in, in general, you'll wind up getting a convolution of the two effects. So I don't think you'll measure either one uh, cleanly. Yeah? If you take the projection into the plane, you get change of length of each segment. Yeah, so I, I am actually losing, I'm losing length along the polymer as I do that. That's actually something I want to return to in a moment. Um, anyway, there's really more important than, than these calculations. There's something to, to emphasize about this persistence length, and that is how it is abused in the literature. Here's what I mean. Um, DNA is a good example of a polymer people worry about the persistence length. 50 nanometers, that's about uh, 150 base pairs, uh, as I recall. I don't think in base pairs, I think in lengths, but anyway. Um, now, uh, there's a lot of proteins that, that, that do special things with DNA, right? They come in and read it, they will break it apart, they do all sorts of stuff. So a lot of them will just bind to it. Now, when a protein binds to DNA, it might introduce a kink. So I've got some strand here, and lo that localized there's some kink. Now, if, you, if I then look at those polymers in a plane, let them, let's say, fall to a surface and measure them with AFM, you will frequently see in the literature that people infer a persistence length for those, pop, those DNAs with bound proteins. And of course, if I introduce kinks, I get a shorter length. So it'll be reported as a reduction in the persistence length, and you'll see people refer to that as a more flexible DNA. Now, um, I'm being you know, a little uh, you know, harsh on some of those papers, because I think they know what they mean when they say flexible, but you should be careful when you read it. Notice, I'm assuming here thermal equilibrium. Otherwise, I have no right to write down a KT. It could be completely irrelevant. So this expression assumes two things. It assumes a homogeneous elastic rod, which we uh, mentioned before. I'm not going to have the time to go too much beyond that, but maybe I can mention some ways in which that deviates. But even within that assumption, I'm also within that approximation, I'm assuming that the, the rod prefers to be straight. That's its energetically, energetic minimum state. So I'm not including kinks in this. Um, that would clearly change this kind of analysis. Furthermore, I'm assuming equilibrium. So I could violate this relationship between a, I would say, a fundamental quantity, which is a mechanical rigidity locally, and an apparent shape or conformation of the polymer characterized by this, I could violate it in at least two ways. Take the system out of equilibrium. Is biology out of equilibrium? Phil, don't you have a theorem about that? The, the Pincus theorem? If you're in equilibrium, you're dead. Yeah. If you're in equilibrium, you're dead. Okay. Um, so obviously, if I'm out of equilibrium, I should be careful uh, doing this. And and to give you a concrete example, microtubules in a cell are never, uh, never exhibit persistence lengths of order a millimeter, in any, at least in any sort of healthy, active cell. Um, actually, that's too strong a statement, but uh, you get the point. Um, uh, so anyway, um, I would distinguish two things. This is a thermal persistence length, or you could say equilibrium. And I would distinguish that from apparent persistence length. If I just look at an image, I could call, I could say what the persistence length of something is. It might or might not in any way reflect a microscopic mechanical rigidity. So, word of caution. Um, okay, so numbers. What about this stiffness here? What should it be equal to? Equal to? Well, let's say I have an elastic medium, elastic rod and I um, try to bend it, um, I might expect that um, the rigidity will be proportional to the Young's modulus. By the way, I'm going to use E for energies and Young's moduli. Don't worry, this will only appear once, and then we'll get rid of it. If you prefer, I could call it Y um, for the Young's modulus. So that's a characterization of just how rigid a material is. Now, um, anyone happen to remember what the units on modulo on, on um, bulk, shear, Young's, whatever moduli are? Pascal. Pascal. Uh, that's also energy per volume. 
Right. So this has units of energy per volume, and I need to construct something which has units of energy times length. Well, um, it's supposed to be a local quantity that tells me how rigid something is to bending locally. What lengths could it, could it depend on? It can't depend on the length of the object, right? It's got to be the molecular scale. So this should go like a to the fourth power dimensionally. And that's as far as you can get without doing an honest calculation. And an honest calculation you can look up in one of those books that Shura um, showed us by Landau Lipschitz, volume whatever of the Bible. Um, and it's pi over four, right? If it's a homogeneous elastic rod. It's not quite pi over four for a hollow. It's circular rod. cross section. Circular cross section, yeah. Okay, so take this prefactor here maybe in quotes. Um, but uh, here's an interesting exercise for you. So question. I've given you numbers for typical diameters, typical persistence lengths. What is the relevant temperature? Room temperature, right? Um, no experiments on any biological system <coughs> except maybe some protein studies make sense if you leave the range of about 300 Kelvin plus or minus a few degrees. Um, so here's my question. Take these examples and see if that picture makes any sense with a typical Young's modulus of a protein. Now, I don't know what that is, but I, I'm telling you that, well, okay, DNA is not a protein. Sorry, that's a little dangerous. Um, surprisingly, the numbers work. Um, certainly for actin and microtubules, they're made of much the same stuff. So you might imagine their persistence length, excuse me, their Young's moduli are comparable. Notice there's about a factor of three difference in their diameter. Three to the fourth power, about 100, right? Notice there's about a factor of 100 between the persistence lengths. Surprisingly, DNA will work out as well, um, to this level of approximation. And the question is, what is the corresponding Young's modulus you get? So just check that out. It's kind of amusing. Um, and then we can think about what that number corresponds to in familiar macroscopic systems. But these intermediate filaments are outliers. They're much, much softer. Notice they're actually bigger than actin in diameter and much softer bending. But for the intermediate filaments, there's a lot of evidence that they have this problem that you just spoke about, that they're not really straight. They have a couple of issues. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, they, they tend to have anomalously small stretch moduli. So it turns out you can, I'll show you data on this in a little bit. Um, you can stretch these, these intermediate filaments quite a bit. Some of them will stretch like a factor of two easily. Um, and they're, they're a little anomalous in their mechanical properties. And I mention it again by way of caution. Although that elastic picture works pretty well, you have to be a little careful. Um, sometimes the structure of the system makes, makes some differences. So if you think of proteins as like little blocks you're building with yeah. that, that's what I want you to think of. Yeah. Uh, the bonds between blocks are as strong as the Ooh. blocks, or is there a little bit of possibility of yeah, so what is the nature of bonding? Well, um, mechanically, right now. Yeah, so, so um, let me remind you, this whole picture only makes sense in linear response, so for linear small deformations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to worry too much about, let's say, stressing those bonds enough to, to potentially break them. No, I'm not worrying about breaking, I'm worrying about the extensibility. Yeah, and I want you to think of them as inextensible okay. for this approximation. Um, and that is violated down here. Intermediate filaments actually have a quite rich structure. Um, so all sorts of digressions we could go into, uh, but uh, let me just say uh, there's a big difference between these guys and this, and that is um, some of you will probably know, especially in the in the case of um, actin and microtubules. I will return to this when we look at active systems. They're polar filaments. That means that you can look at them locally and you know that one orientation is different from another. Intermediate filaments are symmetric. And they're formed by um, uh, a sort of hierarchical structure of uh, elements which come together and bind in symmetric fashion. 
And anyway, they're quite rich. Okay, um, let's start um, doing something with um, these semi-flexible um, filaments. Uh, and I'm going to start with this with DNA. Um, so DNA is really, really long, typically. Um, I mean, even DNA from from bacteria is you know microns long. You get um, at least segments of DNA which are uh, easily microns long. The persistence length is on the nanometer scale. So we might want to think about that initially as a flexible polymer of the kind we've been hearing about. Okay. So let me do the following. Let me look at a freely jointed chain model. By which um, I mean that uh, I have some chain, which I, for reasons which become clear in a moment, I want to orient vertically. And so I've got some long segment up here and some long segment down here. And I just look at two neighboring segments <coughs> of size A. And I want to assume that there's no energy cost for having any bend you like there. It's a nice, flexible joint. Now, why might that be reasonable? Well, um, if I'm looking at a very large scale for DNA, which is a, forms a flexible random coil on large scales, I probably can think of a coarse-grained model of this in which um, segments of length, something like the persistence length, or the Kuhn length, are pretty flex can be treated as flexible segments. Experts keep quiet for a minute. I know this is wrong, but it's, it's instructive to see why it's wrong. Um, so uh, this is the so-called freely chained, jointed chain model. And let me do the following problem. I'm going to take one of these chains. So it's very long, and even though it has a significant persistence length, it can do a lot of bends. And I'm going to put a mass on it. You know, typical uh, mechanics problem put in a mass in a gravitational field, and I got a chain. So let me write down the um, free energy for this system, and let me define a coordinate here, which is x, the <laughs> displacement. So my free energy for this system, including all the effects, are, is going to be the following. I have an energy for the polymer itself, now, I told you it has no energy for bends. So that energy is trivial. That drops out. I have the potential energy associated with this. Um, it's that. Uh, oriented things may be in a slightly funny way, but uh, this has the right sign. And what I've left out, of course, is the entropy. So there's a minus Ts in my free energy. And S is now entropy. And so what does equilibrium correspond to? Minimize a free energy, right? Equivalent to maximizing an entropy and so on. So um, in equilibrium, I have dF dx equals 0. That is minus mg minus T dS dx. Or in other words, and, and of course, what is this? This is just the force that I'm applying on the chain. I get F equals minus T uh, dS dx, or dS dx equals minus F over T. Now that should be familiar from um, thermodynamics. This equation here is like dS dV equal T over T, pressure divided by temperature. Now, obviously, there's a sign difference. Or in a gas, which would satisfy this equation, I have to compress it to keep it in a finite container, right? For this polymer, I have to pull it to stretch it out. So that's what the sign difference comes from. 
Um, it also tells us that this force is purely entropic in origin. Now, you may not have thought about that with ideal gases, but that's true too. You could say the pressure is purely entropic. I know you might prefer to think about molecules bouncing around, but you clearly don't have to do that because the ideal gas law only depends on the density of the gas and not density squared. I don't need to worry about interactions. Okay. Um, and, of course, what we learn is that the force comes from the fact that as I pull this polymer out, I'm taking it into an improbable state for its own fluctuations on its own, you could say, i.e. a low entropy state. I have to work on it to do that. Okay, um, super simple stuff, I know, but it's useful to remember this and also get signs right. Um, what I want to do is actually calculate the relationship between this force and that displacement. And it is actually worth going through an honest calculation here, I think. Um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so how do we model this? Well, my energy, as I said, is um, just minus mgx. Um, I'm just going to replace mg times, but with uh, force, since I've identified what that is. Um, so I get minus f times uh, the extension here. But that extension, so if I have a segment here that makes an angle theta with respect to the vertical, I get an extension due to that segment, which is a times cosine. So that's my energy. Now that might look familiar from a classical magnetic system. If I have magnetic spins that want to line up in a magnetic field, and those are not like real spins, classical spins that can take on any orientation, I get exactly the same energy. So this is a paramagnet with, the, with classical spins. Um, okay, so, um, well, uh, I want to do a relatively honest calculation, pretty honest. Um, so uh, in StatMac, you know, it's, when in doubt, a partition function probably isn't a bad place to start. So what's the partition function? Well, I'm supposed to sum over all my states. Those states will be characterized by these angles. And I have something like this, e to the minus beta times the energy associated with this angle. Uh, I'm obviously building this up step by step. Uh, beta is 1 over kT. So this is my Boltzmann weighting of the different configurations. The sign, the sign. Oh. So um, I have obviously a sum of these cosines that appears in the exponential. I can replace that with the product of the exponentials. So that gets rid of the sum up here. Um, I presumably need to take into account all the different angles. So I get factors like, well, there's actually a as a mutual angle as well, phi. And um, the polar angle. And basically, because this energy factorizes in this way, so does my partition function. So I just do a double integral over these angles for each one of these angles. And take the product. So this thing here is a partition function associated with one of those segments. And well, so it's actually not hard to do. Um, obviously, the phi integral gives me a factor of 2 pi. There's no dependence on that. Um, and the other integral is easy to do if I 
replace this by some variable u, and then here, this is just du, up to a minus sign. So I'll change my order of integration. But when I'm done, I actually get an additional factor of 2, and a hyperbolic um, sign of beta fa over beta k. That's the result of doing what, in the end, just reduces to an integral of exponentials. Hyperbolic uh, <coughs> sign is nothing more than the difference between the exponential minus the exponential of the argument with the other side <coughs> divided by 2. Uh, hence the factor of 2 here. Okay, now, um, that's not really uh, what I want. What I want is to go back and find out what this extension was in equilibrium. So what is that? Well, um, that you want to say that there is an nth power of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this is the quantity here. Yeah, I take a product, right. In other words, this product reduces to just this. Yeah. Because all the bonds are assumed, to, all the links are assumed to be the same. But Fred, this is also uh, this is completely freely jointed, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm starting. I know, and like I said, experts keep quiet a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to find a result which disagrees with experiment. Um, but it's interesting to think about why. So um, I need to do a couple more steps. Uh, so basically, let me just remind you that um, if I take minus f times a, the monomer size, times, whoops, no, minus f times average x, I get this um, potential energy here on average. So this is actually the average energy, um, which is supposed to be um, the um, So I'll write it schematically. I do a sum over all my states <coughs> times the energy in that state times the probability of being in that state, which is this apart from a normalization, which is itself the sum like that, the partition function. And this is nothing more than minus the derivative with respect to beta of the logarithm of z. You'll remember that probably from the stat Mac course. Um, and what it does is it actually allows me from this expression here, by simply taking its logarithm and a derivative with respect to beta, I can extract my average displacement. Now let me write down the result. It's a couple of steps that aren't terribly interesting in their own right. It's probably worth mentioning that this is the same calculation everybody's asked for magnification of a paramagnet. Yeah, I just been, yeah, so this is a paramagnet. Okay. This is a classical paramagnet. This, the, this model here uh, is the classical continuous spin orientation paramagnet. So that may be where you have seen this kind of a calculation before. So, um, okay, I said I would actually write down the result. So what do I get? What I actually get in the end is this. I get a um, displacement Actually, let me write it down this way. I get an average cosine of that angle of it of an average bond in my system, which is um, uh, 
divided by Now, this is actually pretty easy to interpret. Notice what happens when the force is really large. When the force is really large, this term goes to right. This goes to 1, because I have the sum of the exponential of this and the exponential of minus that, divided by the difference. When the argument is large, it's dominated entirely by that first exponential. This goes to 1. Now, if I look at what that means for my displacement, my displacement is n times a times this. So I get 1 times n times a. That's the full extension of the polymer of L minus um, or in other words, Units right? No. Yep. Um, in other words, the force is proportional to 1 over the difference between the full extension and the actual extension. A simple divergence of the force. And that makes sense physically. What's happening is I'm taking my polymer which has a bunch of fluctuations, transverse fluctuations on it, and I'm pulling those out by applying a large force. And right before I pull out the very last fluctuations, I have really, really large forces required to do that. So I get this divergence. <coughs> but that is not what's observed. So here's what's observed. So I extend the polymer. Four, four, zero, four, what? Sorry? Four DNA, let's say. So these are experiments um, on especially DNA. That's one that's been studied the most extensively. And it's force versus extension. And what happens is something like this. You get a linear regime. By the way, that's the same linear regime of flexible polymers. That's a Gaussian chain. It takes on a random coil configuration. You pull on it, you get entropic elasticity. But then as you pull out the last bit of fluctuations, I get a divergence. And it's observed very clearly experimentally that this diverges in a different way. quadratically. Now, so what does this teach us? Well, um, actually, the, the way this fails is as follows. Um, you've sort of already seen this. Um, I think you've seen Pincus blobs, right? Phil's blobs. I am saying so. Yeah. You always shut down. Uh, but when you pull, the point is, when you pull really hard on a polymer, you effectively probe smaller and smaller length scales at high force. And eventually, you start probing length scales down to where it matters in detail whether or not I have free joints or not. And so um, understanding this behavior uh, here presumably comes from a different microscopic energy. Not freely jointed, but where I have uh, elastic rods, if you like, with bending resistance. And this actually goes back to Fixman and Kovac, at least possibly earlier, in the 70s, early 70s. They noted this uh, effect for um, stiff polymers and actually derived it. Um, in the context of DNA, uh, this is usually associated with uh, the, uh, Mar the Marco and Sigia, who, who wrote down actually a uh, sort of um, empir semi-empirical interpolation formula, formula which takes you from the linear regime to the uh, divergence here. 
And um, what's interesting is that this divergence, in functional form at least, is completely insensitive to um, how long the polymer is. In other words, I could start with the, the DNA example of a chain which is very long, which is very long compared with its persistence length. So it's originally a Gaussian chain. Pull really hard on it, and I see this divergence. Or I could start with a short segment. A short segment that looks more like this, with very small fluctuations. If I pull on that, I see the same divergence. I just happen to see a very different linear regime. So the linear regime is quite different in the two cases. This, uh, well, uh, Marco Cicci, if you like, is for uh, polymers which are much, much longer than the persistence length. I'm going to look at the other limit because these persistence lengths get really big in the case of many of these um, filamentous proteins. Now, hmm, do I have time? So, but Fred, let me ask yes. a question here, I mean, uh, which, is, which is something that we all get confused about. Yeah. This 1 over uh, L squared divergence, that divergence is associated with using the spending rigidity. So if I have something, my like polymer, say, is, a, is an alpha helix, it's not right anymore, because I could start to unwind, unwind the helix? Or yeah, so actually, I'm, I'm, also, I'm, I'm also hiding the fact that even DNA doesn't do this at high force. Yeah. At high force, um, several things can happen. I could start uh, pulling on the backbone of the polymer and start stretching it, the, basically probing the, the extensibility of the, of the polymer we were discussing earlier. I could make it undergo uh, significant local conformational changes, let's say pull out the helical structure, I could make DNA undergo a phase transition into a different state, it turns out. Um, I'm leaving, leaving all that out. So this is associated this is with just the, the yeah. just the essential result for this model. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be useful to comment on the range of forces where yeah. different regimes apply. You start, you're going to the linear regime at KT per persistence length, and this diverges only works between KT per persistence length and KT per <coughs> width of your, pole, uh, uh, of your rod, diameter of your rod, because on, on, on forces strong... KT per persistence length. No, you start with KT per persistence length and then end with KT divided by diameter. Because then you, you, you're already killing your undulation modes and you're going into another yeah. regime. So I'm going to assume that this length scale is not only the smallest in the problem, it's irrelevant. But if you put the numbers in, if you put numbers in, they actually go higher than yeah, that, they yeah. see something else. Yeah. <coughs> because um, this is, this is not very large. I mean, the <coughs> meter is. is uh, yeah, so actually, the, the, the force range where this appears is, appears is, is precisely something I want to um, get to. Um, but uh, what I want to do, um, and I am running a little bit behind, I'm sorry, um, is do the analogous calculation with bending stiffness, show you uh, how that works, just to get you a, give you a sense of how one can calculate these things to a uh, rather good degree. Turns out, in a certain sense, the limit that I want to focus on, which is where the, where the polymer is shorter than its persistence length, that's relevant for many of the filamentous protein cases, um, this limit is in a certain sense, uh, well, it, it, it admits a more exact calculation, if you like. I know Phil doesn't like exact calculations. I'm not going to go through the exact calculation. But I'm going to at least show you how you can do it, because in fact, it's interesting to note that you can um, uh, do that rather quantitatively. Um, so let's see how this works. So um, there's, how do I turn the screen off? I don't need the um, computer just yet. 
Um, so my energy for this, again, assumed isotropic elastic rod is going to be the following. Um, I want to um, characterize it by its transverse displacements. So I'm not going to describe it in terms of the angles. I'm going to look at um, small transverse fluctuations. So it's going, to be, it's going to be valid in this lemma here. Because my chain segment is so short compared with the persistence length that due to its fluctuations, it still looks pretty straight. That happens to be a, a nice clean limit to do this in. So if I take two space derivatives, two spatial derivatives of that function describing its transverse displacements, that's the curvature, right? Downward or upward curvature as a function. And I integrate that along the backbone of the chain. That's the um, bending energy. Now, I also have this energy that I'm doing against the, the force that I'm applying. When my polymer contracts by, by uh, exciting thermal fluctuations, if you like, that's actually doing work against the force that I'm pulling on. So I get another term, which is F times the, distance, the difference between the full length of the polymer and its uh, contracted length. So I want to call that, well, delta L, let's say. So here's the picture. I have a polymer which, it, which would extend to here, it's straight, it contracts a little bit. Uh, hang on. That's not right. It's force times the contraction. Because when I contract, I pull up on a mass. If you like. Now, what is this thing? Well, um, if I were to integrate uh, ds along the backbone of the polymer, I get its total length. So this quantity here is L minus the, what I'll call the projected length. So that's this. <coughs> the projected length is the integral along the backbone of cosine theta. Basically the same result that I had before. Or, I could note that, um, yeah, so this is like the integral of dx. So I have ds here and dx there. Now, of course, um, ds I could write as the square root of 1 plus the slope of that function squared, square root, times dx because that gives me, basically by, you know, well, the sum of the squares of a triangle is equal to the square of the um, long length. Um, and so this thing here, um, this square root, I can approximate as 1 plus 1 half <coughs> of 2 prime squared. So just expanding out that square root for small slopes. So again, I'm in the limit where the thing is nearly straight. And so this thing winds up just being, um, so these, 
The one here cancels that term, and I get an integral of the slope squared with a factor of a half ds. So this term up here becomes Yeah, so I'm being a little sloppy between dx and ds, which actually is good in this approximation that the thing's nearly straight. So it turns out there is a higher order correction, which is no worse, if you like, than the terms I'm leaving out here. Slightly subtle point, but basically um, the thing is so straight, the arc length, uh, the integral along the arc length is basically the same as integrating along the <coughs> projection. Uh, what I really need to care about is the integral of the excess length I get because of the shape. You assume it's oriented along the x axis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I choose my x axis to correspond to the end to end vector. So the polymer looks like this. Okay, now, um, let's see, how does one do this calculation? Well, let me sketch the steps in the, in the interest of time. So, I'm going to say that my function, u of s, ultimately I'm going to let this depend on time when I do dynamics, of course. This should just be a sum of Fourier modes of some amplitudes times um, sine function sign because I'm choosing boundary conditions where it's fixed to have no displacement at either end. So the picture is actually more like that. Now, the, the calculation changes a little bit if you use different boundary conditions, but that's not terribly interesting. <coughs> um, these Q's here are pi over L. So the Q's here are pi over L times some integer where the integer is 1, 2, 3, so on. Now, if I plug that into this expression, what I get is the following. calculate the average energy in my system, I get a sum over those modes for each of the two terms that appear in each of these squares here. I get a bunch of sines and cosines. When I do the integral, only the equal sines and cosines, if you like, contribute to the integral. So I just get a single summation over the wave vectors. I get q to the 4 from this derivative here. Every time I take a derivative, I get a factor of q. And likewise, two of those from the expression for the contraction of the polymer. And now I have everything written in terms of the thermal average amplitude of fluctuation. Do you remember the equipartition theorem? I have a classical system. I'm not doing quantum mechanics. I have an energy expression which is quadratic in independent degrees of freedom, the amplitudes of these modes. So I know that the energy associated with each mode is 1 half kT. <coughs> so that gives me a simple expression, which is this. For the amplitudes. Yes. What's the cutoff? What's the cutoff from Q? Yeah, what's the cutoff from Q? Let me get to that later, uh, because it is uh, uh, well, it's sort of related to the earlier discussion, actually. Um, it doesn't make any sense to talk about a wavelength of a deformation of this thing, which is comparable to A. So I would say the real cutoff at high Q is that. Now, it turns out that the energy gets so small for those high Q modes, I don't have to worry about it until I get to super high forces. Energy here. 
<clears throat> yeah, but, but if I look yeah, at the, oh sorry, right, if I look at the amplitudes at high Q, they get very small. Yes. The, energy the energy, you're right. Uh, so, you know, I, I have the usual black body radiation problem, right? I have <coughs> infinite energy because I have, in principle, an infinite number of modes of KT of energy. Um, you know, either put H bar back in or put in a cutoff. But the energy doesn't uh, enter into thermodynamics, if you like. What counts is derivatives of things, like free energies. So when I look at how free energies vary. Anyway, so this is the starting point for a um, more careful calculation of this with bending. Uh, at least in, it's a uh, fairly simple way, I think, of doing it, because it involves uh, just a simple uh, Fourier sum. So let me sketch for you what happens. Um, what I need to calculate here is this quantity. Um, what I want to look at is the amount of contraction I get. That's the, that's the thing I want to look at. That will ultimately relate to this effect here, because I'll do this in terms of the force. So this contraction is just that integral we were talking about before. I take the slope squared together with the factor of a half and integrate it down the chain, that tells me the, the, the missing length, if you like, that I have comparing the contraction to the <coughs> contour length. Sorry, comparing the projected length to the contour length. Now, that calculation is just like the one here, um, which I could do in terms of the Fourier modes, um, except, well, so I'll just write down the result. What I actually get is by integrating cosines or sine squared. Um, I get an extra factor of a half when I do that, so this becomes a fourth. Uh, but now I can express this directly in terms of these amplitudes. And so I get one half kt sum on q Q squared plus F. I have factors of length that drop out. Uh, in fact, pull out a factor of KT. Um, now, let me make one more little step here, which is to notice that there's a characteristic force level. We call it F9. Um, which is what I get when I compare this term at the lowest wave vector q um, to this force level. So that actually becomes pi squared kappa over length squared. That's what this term looks like at the lowest mode. Now that's a very interesting force. That is the classical, OK, this is not a great demo because it's bent already. but. Um, uh, ever heard of Euler buckling? Mm -hmm. So if I compressively load an elastic rod, it'll buckle at a force level that in detail depends on the boundary conditions at the ends, but that force level is that. So this is a mechanical, uh, classical mechanical quantity. And what I want to do is normalize this integral in terms of that.
And the result looks like that. Now, Schroeder mentioned yesterday that um, series basically, what was it? Series basically exist for us to explore their convergence properties. Um, and usually we only need one term. Um, that actually is, uh, that, that's certainly suggested by this expression down here. Because I have such a strong suppression of high Q modes, because it's 1 over Q to the 4, in a lot of the problems that we do, we can actually calculate based on just the lowest mode, and we'll get a pretty good approximation. In fact, you might guess, since the next mode is down by a factor of more than 10, 2 to the 4, that that would actually be a pretty good approximation. Here's an example where I can't do it. And the reason is as follows. I actually need to know how many of these terms are relevant. How many of these terms are relevant? Well, it depends on how big this force is. So you notice I might, be, I might uh, be tempted to say, look, this goes inverse in force. So I'm going to get a contraction proportional to the inverse force. That's going to be this thing, a force related to the uh, extension to the inverse extension of one power. But that's not true, and it, it comes from the fact that I have to worry about a number of terms here. So notice when the force is high, there's no independence that's relevant for small n. So a really crude approximation to the summation would be to say there's a specific n in this summation beyond which I can ignore the summation. And that corresponds to the condition n squared equals f over this f naught. So a really crude approximation to this integral would be as follows. Let me take the inverse f dependence here, multiplied by the number of these terms, and I'm going to leave out various factors. I get something proportional to kt, and it goes like uh, 1 over f over f naught. So I'll write it this way, f naught over f times the number of terms, that's the square root of this, which is proportional to 1 over the square root of x. That corresponds to this result here. So here's an example, Jura, where we actually need to worry about precisely the number of terms in the equation. And in fact, that number of terms depends on the parameter. Still not about the convergence. Well, are you worried about n squared? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, that's as honest a calculation as I'm going to do in view of time. Let me now um, turn. Yes. If I wanted to include the other uh, elastic modules, say stress modules. Stretch modules? Stretch, yes. Yeah, yeah. It would be like changing f. Yeah, so a good way to do that is actually uh, within this procedure here. Um, you see, uh, what I've done is I've calculated the extension as a function of temperature and force. The simplest way to do this, and this actually goes back to something um, uh, Odike did in the mid-90s. Uh, uh, he looked at extension of, uh, he looked at ex extensibility of uh, these chains. Um, and basically what you can say is that I get this thermal extension, or, uh, well, I haven't, hang on. This is a contraction. I haven't done the next thing, which is to look at what happens, the, fun the extension as I pull on it. But you can sort of see I can get that from this. Anyway, what you do is you say, well, in fact, there's two compliances in my system. One is thermal and one is stretch and you add the two compliances. And it would be term similar to that one, probably, right? Because you have to integrate over the, the new dot squared in ah. the tension modules, right? So something like that. Well, no, I need another variable. Uh, so this is the transverse displacement. I need a longitudinal strain variable. So I need to do, if you like, a V coordinate, the strain or displacement along the backbone. What I would mean say is that it would come in like the external force in this equation. Uh, 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 so uh, 
No, I think that's a little, you have to be a little careful. You, you, you do the calculation at a given force level, and then you add two compliances. So what happens is I get an extension here, which is a sum of a thermal one, which is this, plus a stretching one. And so what will happen is this whole thing gets uh, flattened out. The divergence goes away. And what would be there when you approach the maximum extension? Yeah, it will be there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a question of force level. And so just to give you numbers, um, so there's been a lot of experiments on actin over the years, um, and its extension modulus is huge, it turns out. And so basically, more dramatic things happen long before you get to that stretching, like it'll fall apart. You'll really, literally pull it apart. Various intermediate filaments are very stretchable. They'll show this effect, and I actually will show you some real data in which you see that. Yeah. So for just for a continuous rod with the same modulus, what parameter tells you how irrelevant the turn is? How relevant yeah. the stretch? How irrelevant the stretch? There's a parameter that will tell you. Yeah, so what I would need to do is add in some um, use the same bulk modulus for 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 both. Because you've got the rapid drive coming from the bulk modulus, remember it was Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you can assume it's the same modulus for stretch. You can okay, that is very interesting. Okay, so you're, you're, you're going to assign this as a homework problem. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're asking a very interesting <laughs> question. Huh? You're going to assign this as a homework problem. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I'm not quite, I, we don't quite have enough for that uh, okay. just yet. Because we don't have the linear uh, regime uh, for this system yet. Um, but uh, what happens is, um, so you might, you, you, you might think, uh, look, if I pull really hard on the system, ultimately I start stretching it. Uh, stretching the backbone, and that look, I, I agree. But the question is, um, at what level do these thermal fluctuations, these thermal fluctuations may become completely irrelevant at some point. It turns out to be a segment of polymer which is much shorter than the persistence length. And so an interesting lesson to learn is, I can look at a segment which is far shorter than the persistence length, and yet still have dominant thermal fluctuations in its longitudinal sure. reliance. I doubt there's going to be time for that, but I would, we could um, look at that. Okay, so what I want to do in just the last few minutes is... Um, but but, uh, but just to say something, uh, uh, say something more about that. You do this thing, you add the, 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 this other variable, so the strain variable, uh, is that completely independent from the... From the, from the curvature variable? Or? Yeah, that's also, uh, okay, so um, the right way to look at this is these are, this is a phenomenological model. I do not know what happens to things like kappa and the stretch state. If, however, I continue to treat this in the same way as before based on continuum elasticity theory, together with the stretch modulus based on the same physics, then, they have then there's clean answers. But I doubt that's true in detail. Well, so I, I, I suspect that that amounts to basically pushing this phenomenological model farther than you really should. It actually crosses over to back to singular, uh, to, to, to large unit divergence. There is a second crossover from this point. But which is super point. hard to observe. Yeah. At, at kt per bond. Yeah. There is basically go from kt per persistent length to kt per bond. You, you follow this dependence and, and then you go over to you the go over to one of breath. One of yeah. one of our breath. Yeah. And there is a... So the yeah, but differ. So, so uh, uh, Dobrian uh, did this actually yeah. recently, and what he finds, interestingly, is that um, in spite of the fact that this appears in principle, if you look at any real numbers, there, aren't, there isn't any experimental evidence of seeing it. Most, it turns out to be... Most data of, is right, right below at, at the crossover. If you look at the... At the, at the you, can, you can get to the crossover, but there's no convincing data no. beyond the crossover. Absolutely. So it it's, it's, remains an issue more of principle. It's theoretically correct, but no correct. Yeah, so this, I, I would say this is the dominant physics over uh, a physically very reasonable range. Okay, let me just sketch. Sorry, is, is there a typo in there? Sorry? Uh, should that be L square over pi square kappa instead of pi square kappa over L square? The last, the second, second last. Oh, did I flip this? Yes, I did. I think... Uh, Yes, I did, because I pulled out the cube here. Yeah, so you're right. 
Anyway, I was only really interested in the 1 over square root f behavior. It doesn't change that. OK. Um, hmm. OK, so realistically, I'm not going to make this dynamical today. Uh, but let me end with a much simpler way to do these kinds of calculations and then show you some real data. So here is a poor man's way of doing all this. So here's a polymer. I don't know. Let's see. So again, I contract as I do over there. Um, I fluctuate transverse by some amount u. And I mean that this is transverse relative to the center line, or the equilibrium uh, shape. And what I want to do is measure the amplitude of these fluctuations. So I'm going to call that delta u squared. So this thing is constantly fluctuating around, and I want to start characterizing how much. The analog of looking at a Gaussian chain. So I want to ask the question, how much does this thing fluctuate transverse when excited thermal? So um, delta u squared, it's some fluctuating quantity. It's thermal, so it should go like kT. Um, it obviously is suppressed by the rigidity of the filament. Kappa. That's the microscopic parameter, if you like, that characterizes its rigidity. This is obviously an inverse length. It's the inverse persistence length. This has two powers of length. So I presumably have three more powers of length to multiply here. And it's going to be the length of the polymer. Now I'm doing this in the limit that, that, that this length is short compared with the persistence length. So I'm not going to distinguish whether this is the contour length or the projected length. They're almost the same. Looking at a sort of asymptotic limit, which still turns out to be quite relevant. Um, OK, so this is obviously L cubed divided by LP. Um, let's look at the contraction. this thing over here. Well, the calculation's right down here, and you can do it. Let f go to 0. I want to know how much it contracts before I apply a force. It's just a sum over these modes. I have all the amplitudes. We could do it. Um, but I could make the same arguments. It's kT divided by kappa. That's an inverse length. This is a length. So this presumably goes like the square of the length. Look familiar? This L squared that we just identified should be in the numerator. Um, the actual value turns out to be pi squared over 6 times L squared over LP, if you want prefactors. Uh, by the way, if we took nothing but the um, That depends on the boundary conditions. Though. Depends on, yeah, it depends on boundary conditions. It's not worth the labor in this prefactor, uh, but you can do it. Um, but again, it's L squared over LP. Now, that's still not the analog of what's going to give us rubber elasticity or entropic elasticity. Because what I care about is this chain is fluctuating transverse, and it's contracting. After it's contracted, I want to know how easy it is to pull on it. I want to know what the spring constant is in the linear regime. So let's do that. And we can do that by calculating a different fluctuating quantity. And I better use a different color for this. So this end of this polymer is spreading out and forming a cloud of points with various probabilities. And that cloud looks something like this. It moves in a transverse way proportional